And now our sixth strategy in negotiation is another great foundational principle. Read it. What is it? Read it. Say that again. Read it. What is it? Remember what we talked about with Marissa, she put it in writing. When you put things in writing or you get something in writing, you want to make sure that you read it. Too many times people sign things without reading it. And it's so much harder to change once you've put your signature on it than beforehand. You want to read it before you sign it. I annoy the heck out of anybody that has a long, one of those long contracts, if I'm buying a car or something like that. I'm like, I'm reading everything. I want to make sure there's nothing in here that is going to get me in trouble. You can get yourself in a lot of trouble by not reading things before you sign it. But since I know there's a lot of professional speakers in here and a lot of people who want to be professional speakers, I thought I would bring three clauses from a seven-page contract I received for a potential speaking engagement for us to go over and show why it's very important to read it. Let's look at the first one. The speaker agrees to sell at least five tickets for attendees to attend the women's conference for locations the speaker is participating at. Should the speaker fail to sell the five tickets at $49 per ticket, that's $245, the speaker agrees to pay company the sum of $500. What? what? Exactly what? For the non-sale of tickets or the balance thereof on or before a week prior to the conference date. If you, first of all, as the speaker, they're requiring the speaker to sell tickets. And when I asked them how many they were expecting, they said 80. That usually means about 30. And all the speakers on the program would be filling the room with their people. I, have to sell, I would have to have sold five tickets or pay, if I didn't sell the tickets, if I didn't simply buy the tickets at $245, I'd have to pay them $500. What is wrong with that picture? <laughs> a lot's wrong with that picture. This is something that was in a speaker contract. Pay, that's paying double what they're asking you to do. Okay, that's a little crazy, but wait, there's more. It gets better. Are you ready for it? This one, this one's, okay. Any speaker who fails to appear must pay a $25,000 non-appearance or failure to appear at any of the marketed events. I, this is exactly how it was in the contract. I think it was supposed to be for failure to appear, but I put it the exact way it was in their contract. So they didn't catch that typo. That's going in the shredder, one person said. Yes, $25,000 for, okay, realistically, 30 people at the event, and you, everybody, all the speakers have to sell the tickets. And if I don't show up, $25,000. And let me tell you the big problem with this from a contract's perspective. There is no out for this. The way this is worded, if you were injured and couldn't appear, or heaven forbid, if you died and couldn't appear, they could sue your estate for $25,000 the way this is written. Is that fair and reasonable? No. Okay, there's one more. You think this is bad enough, right? Oh, no. No, no. We have one more. Speaker shall be the owner of all intellectual property, rights, and body in the presentation that he, she gives. Mm, okay. Speaker assigns exclusively, people are reading ahead, they're laughing. Speaker assigns exclusively to the company all right, title, and interest in and to the presentation presented at the events only. Company shall not be restricted from any activity with respect to the presentation. Company in turn hereby grants to the speaker a non-exclusive royalty-free license to use, reproduce, and distribute the presentation and any materials used in conjunction with the presentation, all rights reserved. Let me explain what this is saying. I use, I have 50 strategies in my book that I ebb and flow depending on the audience. I use this presentation a lot. So basically, they own this presentation. They own the photos in it. They own the, the whole presentation. They can do what they want with it, include, reproduce it, sell it, use it themselves. They, now they own my presentation. 
sure, I still have the intellectual property rights to think like a negotiator, but now they own this. And they've given me a royalty-free license, but what if they decide to revoke that license or then charge for it? These are things thinking like a negotiator. And one thing I'll say about reading it, if you read a contract and you don't understand it, have a contracts professional or a contracts attorney or somebody that understands the language read it for you so you don't get yourself in trouble. The last strategy in my book says you can't negotiate with crazy. <laughs> Obviously, this went into the shredder, like somebody said because you can't negotiate with crazy. Sometimes a bad agreement is better than no agreement. Unfortunately, I know somebody who signed this. I went to look at the website. They had pictures of speakers on there, and I saw a, a colleague. I reached out to her and attached the contract, and I said, did you get this contract? Oh, uh, I'm speaking at that event, yes, but did they send you this contract? Uh, maybe. Did you sign it? Well, I don't, I, uh, I think, I don't know. <laughs> like, you don't know, we're talking. And she never would say that she did sign the contract. She did tell another colleague that she signed it. She's like, thanks for looking out for me. Basically, they now own her intellectual property that she presented at that event. You have to be very careful about reading it before you sign it. This is one of those writer-downers as well. Actually, everything's a writer-downer, but <laughs> you want to make sure that you read it. Like I said, it's much harder to get out of something once you've signed it. It's harder to negotiate, it's harder to modify, because you've agreed to it. Going back with the excuse of, well, I didn't know, that won't hold up. It's not an excuse, but a lot of people are in a hurry and they don't read it. I read every single thing and if it's something is confusing to me and I don't understand it, I get somebody else's opinion or I ask them, what does this mean? What does this say? What are you saying? There was another, I'll give you another example. I was, I live in close to Los Angeles, so we're Hollywood, a lot of Hollywood stuff going on. And I went to an Emmy viewing party one day. There's a friend of mine, she and I went and we were, walking around, talking to people. And we were talking to this one lady, and there was a guy with a camera following her around. And she walked off, and we're standing there, and this team comes up and says, she's being considered for a reality TV show. We need you to sign this document. Legal size paper, eight-point font, dark, can't see anything, don't have my reading glasses. I said, well, I'll, I'll be happy to sign it, uh, read it, and then give me a fax number and I'll send it to you. Oh no, it's just the standard legal stuff. No big deal, sign it. Who cares, it's the lawyers, you know, blah, 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 is what he's saying. I'm, no, I'm going to read it. We went back and forth a few times. He gave in, wrote the fax number down, sent me on my way. Next morning I got up and I looked over the contract and there was one clause in particular that says, we have the right to use your image and likeness in any way we deem fit, including a negative, derogatory manner. That one also went to the shredder. Standard stuff, the importance of reading it. Getting in writing is very important, but once you get in in writing, you have to read it. 